Thanks, Kristen. Uh, it's great to be here and to uh, have already interacted a little bit with um, some of you guys. I didn't know she started giving me all ladies class, so I've got to adjust to that a little bit. For you. Whenever my wife has a whole bunch of women over, I just need to leave the house or the state <laughs> in the country at times. So uh, that's not, it's not that I don't enjoy it. It's just, you know. Anyway, so um, what I thought I would do today, maybe just... Um, was, was to pick one race that I've done and just kind of take that race apart and share some things I learned about racing and life uh, in that race. And um, so what I'll do today is I'll just go through 10 things that I learned. I'll reference the race a few times uh, or maybe more. And then what I'll do is when I'm done with that, I'll kind of just tell you how the race went, kind of more blow by blow, and then have a Q&A. So this is over at what time? 11 o'clock. Oh, okay, wow, great. Okay, good. So, yeah, plenty of time. Um, all right, so I just want to start by saying that, uh, you know, that's a nice introduction, and all of that, I think, wow, who's that guy? Because I was a really bad athlete. I was not, I never made one varsity team in, in high school. Um, I, in seventh grade, went out for wrestling, and I had one match and got pinned. I um, got cut from teams. You know, you go to the locker room to see if your name's on the list the next day after tryouts, and mine wasn't. Uh, when it did show up, I would sit the bench most of the seasons. Uh, one time in ninth grade, I, actually, I made the football team, and I think I got in like five plays the entire year. I got in like three games for a play or two. And so um, one time I, was, uh, I played halfback when I played, which wasn't much, but so they called this play where I was supposed to go around the end and block this guy so that the other ball carrier could follow me. So I was, I was excited just to be in the game. And this was wild. This was cool. So I'm running around the corner, and some linebacker came up and just hit me. So hard the lights went out. Complete blackness. And I could, like, hear voices, but it was just black. And then, and then I could feel people kind of jostle me around and it kind of jerked my head a little bit. And then it was like I could see light at the far end of this tunnel, just a, a round piece of light out there. And, and they jerked my helmet around the rest of the way. So I was <laughs> <laughs> not much of an athlete. Uh, one time in basketball in high school, I did play JV, but um, I did something that I don't know that any human beings ever done before in a basketball game in the history of the sport because I was standing there ready to throw the ball in bounds, and the ref was right next to me, and he put the whistle on mouth and put his hand up, you know, to start the clock when it goes in. And I was right there, and I saw his hand go up, and I just took off dribbling in bounds. <laughs> From out of bounds. There's, there's no call for that. There's no, there's no motion. There's no one ever done that. He just blew his whistle and said, hey, you can't do that. So, um, my senior year in college, I went to a little NAIA school in Kentucky, and uh, my senior year I went out for track. Having never run competitively in my life, I went out for track as a senior in college. Uh, it's because there were only like nine guys out for the team, and all you had to do was basically fog a mirror and jog a little, and you could be on the team. Uh, so I qualified in those two accounts and got on the team. Um, we went to this great big, big invitation of like 12 schools. One of them, uh, Eastern Kentucky University was there. I mean, they're like Division One or Two. And here's a little NAIA as we're about the longest race. They had. I wasn't fast, so I was trying to run long. So um, the race started out, and, and it was eight laps, a two mile, you know, eight laps around. On my sixth lap, I noticed that the leaders were like getting way ahead of me, which actually meant they were behind me. <laughs> and I had this horrible thought that no man in the history of track has ever gotten lapped in a two-mile race. That's only eight laps. And so I ran harder and faster and think I can't let that happen. Sure enough, on my seventh lap, they came right on by me for their eighth. They finished, and I had, I crossed the line behind them and had to run a whole other. Wow. So I tell you all that just to tell you that um, I don't come from some great athletic pedigree, and, um, <laughs> but what I do tell you is that I've spent 30-something years practicing, training, long-distance running, and about 19 years now in triathlon. And I want to encourage you all that if you, if you find something that you really love and you really focus on it and you really work hard at it over time, you can um, go way beyond anything that you could imagine. Because uh, for me to have made the age group Team USA team go race 
with, it, with it, like a blue uniform that says USA on it. Can you imagine? I'm the guy that sat on the bench all the time, okay? I'm the guy that barely got in games, and here I am with Team USA. And that's just like, I can't be played. So, but that, that speaks to um, trying to develop a God-given gift. We all have gifts. We need to develop them. And working very, very hard uh, in training, being disciplined, and then learning everything I can along the way. I'm still learning all the time. I read the magazines. I, I get on the websites. I'm still constantly learning. <coughs> so anyway, I just wanted to share that with you, uh, just so you know that um, all this is as much a surprise to me as anybody else. So I thought I'd pick one race, and I, I, I'm going to pick one from last year that I did, because... Uh, I had never done anything this long before. I did, originally, you know, after college, I ran some 5Ks and 10Ks and did okay in those, and then I thought I'd try half marathon and did that, and then from there I went to a marathon and did that, and then four weeks after the marathon, there was a 50-mile ultramarathon, and I thought, well, I can't run 50 miles, but I ran 26, so somewhere in between there, I'll probably just poop out. <laughs> uh, I'd like to just know how far I can go. So I lined up for the 50 miler. We were, we were running from Frankfurt, from uh, Frankfurt, Kentucky to Louisville, Kentucky. And um, so I had no idea what I was doing. I turned to the people next to me and I said, hey, at the starting line, have you ever done one of these? Yeah. How do you do these? Well, you just, you just walk and then run and then walk and then run. I said, well, can I just hang with you guys? And they said, yeah. So I just stayed with them as long as I could. And, uh, you know, we'd run, we'd run 10 minutes. We'd jog 10 minutes and walk three or four. And, you just keep alternating off and on. Pretty soon, nine hours later, I crossed the finish line. So uh, I got, I've got this thing in me. Like I don't like not making my goals. Um, I'm kind of focused that way. Sometimes it gets me into danger because I get injured and stuff. But, so, um, but I, I thought today I'd pick just uh, one race because I'd never, never gone this far before on my bike. Training for my Ironman races, I'd gone maybe 115 miles for my longest long ride. Because the Ironman distance is 112, so I want to just go beyond that so I know I could do it. Um, but my wife works for a company called Landmark Group. They're a real estate and property management group. In fact, they're just down on Dodge Street, right down across from Channel 7. Well, the owner, Dave Palladino, is going to put on this ultra cycling three state race. Uh, since my wife works for the company, she said, I think you should really do this. And I said, I don't think I should do that. She goes, no, I think you should. It would be really good, good for me because you're supporting my boss, and this is good, and you really should do it. So I like challenges. So uh, I got on the website and looked, and it started in Omaha, went down to the, high, the, the 370 bridge down on wherever south of here, and then it crossed over the bridge into Iowa through Glenwood, and then it kind of ran parallel to Interstate 29 for quite a ways along what's called the the... Los Hill Scenic Byway. <laughs> now, I've seen some scenic places. I'm not sure I'd use scenic for that term, but it's okay. It's Iowa. You know, Iowa didn't have all that much to work with. So, uh, the scenic byway, and then it went, and then it crossed over into Missouri, and it, the turnaround was 86 miles out at the at Rockport, Missouri. So I thought well, this was a little crazy, but um, how do you train for something like that? I don't know. I didn't. You know, I, I only had like uh, about about nine weeks, I think, from the time I decided I'd do it. So I thought, well, the only way to train for this is just ride your bike a lot. So I did some, some long rides and tried to get ready for it. Um, so here are a few things I learned. Here's a few. Number one, you can always do more and endure more than you think you can. Uh, you might look at a race or a goal you have and think, yeah, you know, can I, can I really do that? Can I really run a full marathon? I mean, that's probably, you know, I know how I felt at the end of 13. How could I ever go 26? And you, and you have these thoughts and just most of our limitations are mental. We've heard that before. We know that, but it's so real. We are, we are boxed in right up here in our brain thinking that we can't do that. We can't go beyond. Uh, but about 80 to 90 percent of our limitations are mental. I really believe that because I have lived that out. I have experienced that uh, many, many times. So uh, as I looked at this distance, I thought, man, can I do this? Can I even finish 172 miles? I don't know if I can even go that far, uh, let alone the fact that this is a race and I am highly competitive. <laughs> and if somebody says on your mark and say, go, I just go. And so I knew that I would be competitive in my mind, but I had no clue if I could be, actually be competitive. I mean, who does these kind of races? They had a solo division, they had a two-person relay division, and a four-person relay division. 
So of course I had to sign up for the solo division just to see if, uh, if I could do it. Um, so um, I, I just learned fresh and anew that you can do more than you think you can. So I just wanted to leave that with you. And you can endure more pain than you think you can. Um, so which takes me to number two, which is press through times of pain. This picture is on the way back in Glenwood, Iowa at about the 150 mile mark. Now let me tell you, I was hurting bad. My knees, if it weren't for my knees, I would have been fine, but my knees were hurting so bad, it felt like knives were being jabbed in them. Uh, because tendons and things, I just hadn't, they weren't, <laughs> they weren't used to it. No kidding. Who does this? So um, they were killing me. Uh, it was a cold, windy day. We went uh, out 86 miles with a 20 mile an hour tailwind from the north behind us. And then we turned around. And guess what? <laughs> we got to ride 86 miles back into a 20 mile an hour headwind, having already raised 86 miles. Plus, not to mention, there's some bad, bad hills for about 12 miles coming out of Rockport. And then Glenwood, <coughs> Iowa, if you've ever been there, there's it kind of sits up on top of the bluffs, and you got to get up there, you got to get. So this is going up the hills in Glenwood trying to uh, finish the last 20-something miles or so. So I knew this would hurt. I didn't know how much it would hurt, but I had to deal with that ahead of time. I had to decide that, you know what, it's going to hurt, but that's okay because pain doesn't last forever, but accomplishment does. So that always encouraged me. Pain doesn't last forever. So you got to press through times of pain. Now, you got to be smart. The flip side of that coin is don't be stupid and get injured. But sometimes it's worth the risk. <laughs> just to try to hit a new goal. So there's times just to press through the pain. You can endure a whole lot more pain. Uh, how many of you have had babies? Okay, so see, no racing you'll ever do probably will compare with that. Unless you had a full left girl and never felt anything or something. But um, anyway, press through times of pain. Number three, stop and get aid when you need to. Um, I knew that there would be aid stations about every 20 miles or so. And so... My goal was to stop at those aid stations and take a little break. Yeah, but what if like the leaders were getting away? Or stop and take a break. Stop and smell the roses along the way. Um, it's important mentally. It's important physically. And so uh, I did that. I did that. Now I carried some too. I carried a little uh, a tummy pack that had. Uh, I'm I, obviously I like Hammer Nutrition, and so I had all their nutritional stuff, their gels and goos and and tablets and all that stuff in my tummy pack. And uh, I, was, I was taking those. But uh, at these aid stations, I would definitely stop uh, because it was important just to give my legs a little bit of a break. Um, so in life, in work, in athletics, we've got to have those, those times where we just stop and take a break. Uh, the aid stations of life, if you were. And they're kind of different for different ones of us. Maybe working out is your, maybe actually working out can be your aid station. It's that, it's that other thing you do where maybe the kids aren't calling your name or work's not screaming at you. But we need those things where we can take a break at some type of aid station of life. So, okay, number four. The posture you choose in life can help you slice through adversity or it can blow you away. Now, my triathlon bike is all dialed in in terms of being arrow. Call arrow, so you get down your arrow bars in your arrow position because if you sit up, your body acts like a sail and just obviously slows you way down. And so I wanted to be as arrow as I could. I tried to choose, choose the best posture so that I could slice through the wind um, and the arrow helmet and so on and so forth because I, I wanted as least resistance as possible in this race. And so um, this is a big deal in triathlon, you know, because it's a big deal to try to get as arrow as you can so you get the arrow wheels and the helmet and all this stuff to try to slice off as much. Every second counts, you know, especially in the shorter races. Every second does count in the shorter races. So um, our position in life, uh, in, in our attitude, in our mind, uh, attitudes of gratitude and thanksgiving, uh, a focus on others and serving other people and helping others, those are the kind of attitudes in life that put us in the right posture to be able to cut through a lot of the junk that life throws at us. We think we have it bad until we try to go and serve somebody else that has it worse, and suddenly our problems are put into perspective. And so it helps a lot that way. Um, so, number five, look to God's signs in nature for encouragement. Um, 
About 20 miles into the race, just as we got to the beginning of the hills in Glenwood, Iowa, I was, I was going along and, and I noticed a dead bird on the side of the road. <laughs> and I thought, I hope that's not a that's coming for me. But then I remember, I remember, I'm a pastor, so I remembered in the Bible that it says that God notices every bird that falls. And I thought, wow, if God, God noticed that bird, you know what? He's watching out for me. I'm more valuable than a bird, I hope. And so, uh, you know, he's watching out for me. That encouraged me. Then, a little further, just up the road, I looked and there were these hawks that were just kind of soaring above the bluffs. And I remember the Bible verse about we can mount up with wings as eagles and run and not get weary and walk and not faint. I just got encouraged. And then there were some pretty flowers along the way. It was May, so flowers were coming up. And so I tried to just draw encouragement wherever I could. I love nature. I love camping and fishing. And I love just getting out in, in God's creation and just in taking it all in and enjoying it. So for me, I was just grabbing whatever I could along the way for some emotional and mental and spiritual encouragement. So, look to God's signs in nature for encouragement. Um, and all through life, not just in races. Um, look to people who love you for encouragement. God's love often flows through them. So, this has nothing to do with the race, but we had, my wife and I had gone through kind of a tough time, and it was 10 at night, and, and our doorbell rang on a Sunday night, and I went to the door thinking, who in the world's at our door at 10 at night? I opened the door, and I just saw, like, some flowers kind of in a line coming off our porch and going down our uh, down the walkway that led to our driveway. And I thought, Jen, I thought somebody had come and, like, vandalized Jen's little bouquet out front, put flowers out, throwing them on our porch or something. But we went out there, and the college group that we worked with had, had come and, and stealth, and stealth done this driveway for us. And they had written all these, we have a four-car we don't have four cars, but we, this house happened to have four car driveway. And all over, all these encouraging notes. And we were going through a hard time, and that meant the world to us. We just went out in the driveway and both teared up. And they were hiding, you know, in bushes and stuff, and they jumped out. And, you know, and that. But they brought us some, you know, some, some stuff. They brought me some cliff bars and peanut butter. They know I love those things. And flowers for Jen. And so for us, it was just um, a point of encouragement, a big, a big point of encouragement. Um, on that race day, the race rules allowed you to have um, an aid vehicle if you wanted one. So I talked to my wife. Now, my wife doesn't do any of this stuff. She thinks I'm a little crazy, but she's very supportive of all this stuff. So I said, look, Jen, would you be the, the support vehicle for me on this day? And it'll be all day. It's going to be an all-day deal. So she said, yeah. So I got this box that she set right in the passenger side seat of our car. And had all these bottles pre-prepared with heat and perpetual and water and, and another tummy belt for, this, for the way back. Because I had one for the way down, 86 miles, I had one for the way back. And when I would go to these aid stations, she would be waiting for me. And so when I pull in, uh, I would just like throw the empty water bottles down, grab the new ones, put them in and go. Okay? The other guys, didn't, a lot of them didn't have that. So they would like kind of, you know, get, the, get on the bike, walk their bike over to the food table and get what they needed. And, and, and meanwhile, I'm like down the road a little bit. <laughs> so, um, but she was an amazing, amazing encouragement to me. Uh, the, the most encouragement um, the whole day that I received was from her. As the day went on, I started like at about the 120 mile mark. I started, this sounds kind of weird. You're women, maybe you'll appreciate this more than most guys who are a little more rational and not so emotional. But I started feeling very emotional. I felt emotional. I felt um, like I needed her. I needed her presence. I needed her words of encouragement. And as we got farther and farther into the race, I, I at one point at an after an aid station, I said, I said, just go two miles down the road and yell at me when I go by. <laughs> go ahead, Lane, way to go, keep going. And I said, do it again. Took two miles of so we start playing. <laughs> because I emotionally and mentally needed her support. You're doing great. You look great. You know, she's just yelling all this stuff at me. And I was like a man of the desert getting water. I was just like, oh, drinking in those words of encouragement. It meant more than any other race. And I know how important people cheering you on and all that, I, the Iron Man and all that kind of stuff. But maybe more than any other race in my whole life, I needed that encouragement. And then a buddy 
For a moment, I'll pulls up next to me in his car, out of the blue. Gary, what are you doing? Hi, this came out of the cheery I said, don't worry about it on the road and chase me. <laughs> so I had both of them kind of doing this loop for all day. But I, I just, I can't really put into words how badly I needed that. And so, um, look, uh, look to people who you love for encouragement. God's love often flows through them. Um, yeah, okay, next one. Um, number seven, prepare before testing comes, because testing is coming. And I don't know if the uh, cemetery back there is symbolic. <laughs> I was about ready to just pull over and climb into one of the holes that they were making uh, at that point. This was uh, coming through, uh, I believe this was coming through uh, Glenwood on the way back, and again, I was hurt pretty bad at that point. But I knew this was going to be one of the biggest athletic tests of my life. I knew it. And so I had to prepare. And so even though I only had about nine weeks from when I decided, um, I laid out a plan. So I did rides, I think five of them on the actual course. Now I live out on Maple at 156. So I had to drive all the way down to where the course started and actually start riding different chunks of the course on my training days. So I rode 70 miles, then I rode 90 miles, then I rode 105 miles twice, then I rode 115 miles, then I rode 120 miles, and my longest training ride was 130 miles. And 130 miles, I was spent. And I thought, dude, you got 42 more miles to go. You're never gonna make it. You're never gonna make it. Yes, you can, you can do it. <laughs> you know what it's like, you have those voices in your head. And um, listen to the one that's encouraging, not the other one. And on those training rides, last spring, I don't know if anybody, you probably don't remember, but last spring was like the coldest, rainiest, windiest spring we'd ever had. Every time I went out there to ride, there was like these 20, 30 mile an hour winds. And I was thinking, I can't believe this. But you know what that did for race day? When I, I don't want to get him myself. So, anyway, <laughs> wind and cold, but it bred confidence in me. And I was riding the course. I'm a big believer in, if you're going to do a race, know the course. So... I knew every crack in the road almost for 86 miles. And I knew where um, the little towns were that we went through. I knew where the bridges were. I knew where encouraging signs that people, uh, just, just like regular billboard kind of signs were encouraging. Um, I knew where the topography would kind of change going into Missouri, kind of opened up and became more of a prairie instead of the, the bluffs right there on your left the whole way going south. So um, it bred confidence in me. So. Prepare before testing comes because testing is coming. Just in life in general, of course, but also if you take on a sport or take on a race or something like that. Um, okay, uh, next one. Have a plan, test the plan, practice the plan. If it works, stick with it no matter what on race day. And I'll say more about that in just a minute. But I had a nutritional plan, I had a pacing plan, and I had a heart rate plan. I, I train a lot off of my heart rate. And uh, there's you know these five zones. Zone one is like, you don't feel like you're doing anything. Zone two is comfortable, you can talk, but you're still doing it. Zone three is a little harder, you're breathing harder. Four and five are like, it's really hard. Five, you're almost dead. So, uh, but I train a lot in zone two because it builds cardio endurance. And so all of these long rides, my longest training ride was seven hours in zone two. Zone two, zone two. I'm just continuing to build that cardio machine. If you train in zone two, it's, um, it allows your heart to develop the most. It teaches you to, your body to burn fat instead of carbs. So it's a lot, a lot of good things can happen there. We can talk about that during Q&A if you want to. But I had a plan, a nutritional plan, 300 calories an hour. 300 calories, and I knew how I was going to get them every hour. I had three different things I was going to use, and I was going to alternate each hour so that I didn't get bored. <laughs> so I had heat and hammer gel. That was 300 calories the first hour. The next hour, I used Perpetuum Solids, which is 200 calories. They're these little things with these tabs that you suck on and chew on. Uh, that was 200 calories plus a shot of gel made 300. And the, and the next one, I ate a hammer bar, which is about 270 calories. So I rotated those three things every hour to get in my 300 calories, plus I drank water like, like crazy. Because I knew that if I got dehydrated in this race, I was toast. So, um, so yeah. Um, so I had a plan. You gotta have a plan. I practiced the plan. Up to 130 miles, the plan worked. Now when race day came, I was tempted to abandon it, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But first, um, number nine, monitor all systems all the time. During that whole day, I was taking inventory. 
How do you feel? How are you doing? Do you need to just stop at this next aid station and not just blow through it with the new bottles from your wife? And do you need to maybe stop and just stretch a little bit? Do you need to just get off your bike? Sometimes if you just, just stretch like this, even now, it just feels good. And, you know, just leaning forward, and I can feel my lower back. Oh, it stretches. It feels so good. Do I need to do that? Or should I keep going? Well, part of how I was doing in the race and what place I was in was going to determine all of that, right? So, but monitor all systems. And it's true in life. In life, we need to monitor how things are going, the different areas of our life, and pay attention to those that need help. So uh, self-evaluation is super important. Uh, places in my life where I need help, I get counsel. I talk to somebody that can help me. I get a different perspective on things. And so, um, yeah, that's just kind of a little life principle. Monitor all systems all the time and get some help in areas if you need them. If you're driving down the road and your oil light was on in your car, it's time to stop and get some help. Because if you don't, you'll burn your engine out, right? So the same in life, same with your body, with your mind, your heart, your spirit. So, so monitor all systems all the time. And then um, take in nutrition on a regular basis or you'll not make it. So I already told you about my 300 calories an hour. And in life, you know, what's your nutrition in life? Life is an ultra marathon. It's not a sprint. And so all of us in life need to have nutrition. I'm not just talking about healthy food for our bodies. That, of course, is super important. But um, our minds, our hearts, our life, our relationships, our careers, what in those areas, and you might just list different areas of your life and write down, what could nutrition be in these areas so that I can stay strong in these areas? So again, I'm, I'm flying through a lot of stuff today, so just bear with me. Each one of these we can talk a whole lot more about. So, um, so yeah, nutrition. My wife and my tummy pack and the aid stations provided all the nutrition I needed on that day. And I got to say, even though I was hurting, and even though at the end of 172 miles, I was wasted, I didn't have any uh, major hitting the wall events. You know, they talk about in a marathon, you hit 20 miles, you hit the wall, or whatever, bonking they call it sometimes in, in triathlon or cycling. I didn't have any of those experiences. I had a pretty steady energy level most of the way. Obviously, the last 40, 50 miles, I started getting tired, started hurting. But no hitting the wall, and that was because I stuck in my nutritional plan. So, okay. So now let me just tell you how the how the uh, well nutritional plan. Let me just show you this thing. This is this is kind of fun, but uh, as it relates to a nutritional plan, um, here's a little here's a little mouse that. Uh, <laughs> He's getting his nutrition. Won't be surprised if it's a dream. you make you stronger. <laughs> so what was the mouse's secret? Nutrition. Oh, <laughs> Alright, so nutrition is very important. Um, and it's true, what doesn't kill you can make you stronger if you let it. So, so here's how the race unfolded, okay? Because I, I'm a, I'm a, I like to compete. I'm in a race. Now, there are only 11 people that signed up for the solo division. And that would make sense because there's only about 11 morons in each state. So, <laughs> so uh, there's no drafting rule, meaning you can't get up in packs and get right behind people. You can save like 20 or 30% energy if you're drafting right behind somebody, right? So in the pre-race meeting, they said there's no drafting. Well, what happens when we get over the 370 bridge and into Iowa Four, five, six guys get about 200 yards up the road and they all pack together and start drafting. And I'm back there, you know, I'm an honest guy, I don't want to cheat. 
But I'm like, what are those guys doing? You know, and the race director went by me and I said, hey, tell those guys to knock it off. Oh, yeah, all right, all right. Well, they, he said something, but they just kept drafting. So I started getting really bothered by that. So I decided, okay, Link, you can, you have choices. Just stay back here and be bothered. Get up with them and draft, not an option. <laughs> Uh, or get ahead of them so you don't have to look at them. <laughs> so at about 42 miles into the race, I took the lead and put them behind me. Now, there's a good life principle, right? Put, put in your rear view mirror those things that bug you as much as possible, right? So now I'm, I'm leading. I'm, I'm not a bike racer. I'm a triathlete, but I'm in a bike race, and my first ever really ultra one, and I'm, and I'm not leading. Like, there's pressure that goes that. It's wonderful, and it's terrible. It's wonderful because I'm leading. It's terrible because you got these monsters chasing you from behind and you don't know, you know what's going to happen. Well, so I stayed in the lead from like 42 miles until about 70. As we headed into the hills that took us down into Rockport, Missouri, two guys from that pack caught me. One was a young guy. I'm obviously not one of them. And the other guy looked like a Tour de France writer. He had these quads that were just like tree trunks. I thought this guy was strong as a horse. So going up hills, this guy, this guy would just pass me, the strong guy. And going down hills, I would just fly to catch up with him. And then up hills, and this, this repeated itself like 10 times. He'd pass me up, he'd, go, he'd leave me in the dust up the hill, and I'd catch him on the downhill. Well, just as we were getting to pull into Rockport, the third guy then caught up with us, and all three of us came into the turnaround together. I thought, buddy, we got a race on our hands today. <laughs> so this is, this is getting exciting. But my wife Jen was there. She had the bottles. Now, at the halfway point, they had a much bigger food table. Well, these other two guys come up, they get off their bikes, set them against the table, and they're like ravaging around, getting things and putting them in. Meanwhile, I fly in, bottles off, bottles on, you tell me back on, and I'm gone. And I'm out of town, and, I, and, and they're behind me. But I don't know where they are because I've opened up, I've opened up my first gap on these guys since you know they caught me. So now what's really bad is I'm, I'm winning, but I have no clue if they are... 45 seconds behind me, because this, this is kind of a curvy, you know, you can look back every now and then, uh, or if they were, you know, half an hour behind me as things went on and on. Uh, so anyway, uh, now we're heading into these winds, right? 20 mile an hour winds, 86 miles to go, and here's, I just buckled down, I said, Link, you have done this before. That's what all the training was about. Every single training ride you did this spring, when the winds were howling to the point where sometimes you would just sit up and laugh, like this is ridiculous. <laughs> All of those, you have done this before. Not for 86 miles, not with guys chasing you, but you've done this before, you can handle these wins. So I encourage myself. I think self-talk is super important. If you could hear in my brain what's going on during the race, most like shorter triathlons, I am like, great job, way to go. Good swim. Oh, you're so smooth. You look like Michael Phelps. This is awesome. I get out of my and said, so that swim was amazing. Oh, that was such a good swim. Now look, settle in, relax, okay? You know, pace yourself, okay? And I'm constantly talking to myself. Constantly talking to myself. So it's a biblical principle because in the Old Testament, King David says he encouraged himself in the Lord. We can encourage ourselves with self-talk in a, in a very powerful way. So uh, I was doing that as we headed back into the wind. Well, when we got to the final climb, it's a long one, the worst climb in the Glenwood Hills. I had led all the way to the 150-mile mark now. I didn't know where these guys were. My wife's at the top of the hill waiting for me. Come on, come on, come on. And there was a worst hill. It's like, if I can get over this hill, I can make it. And then she looks back just as I'm coming by. She goes, somebody's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you've got to be kidding me. So she said, I heard you out. I'll go back and see if it's a relay rider or a solo division person. Those were the like, that was like the longest two minutes of my life until she pulled back up to me and yelled out the window, it's a relay person! Oh. <laughs> so anyway, long story short, I came over the 370 bridge back into Omaha, up 13th Street or 10th Street, past Rosenblatt, all of that, heading back toward the Quest Center, which is where we started. Actually, the Gallup thing just north of there. So... Early in the morning when we left, it was dark, and we'd come through the ConAgra complex. Lots of streets, lots of curves, right? So I'm winning the race. I'm, I'm a mile from the finish line, and I get lost in the ConAgra oh, complex. Oh. I go down a road, it's like dead end. It's like, oh, no. And I go down another road, I, I can't, I'm like, it was dark. I didn't notice where we were going. And I thought, I'm going to lose this race because I got lost one mile from the finish line. I know every crack in the road, 86 miles from here, but I don't know my way through here. 
Well, finally, I found my way out, and thankfully, nobody had come by me. And so I, I crossed the line, and, uh, and I won. And uh, I got off my bike, and now it started raining on us when we came over the 370 bridge. So like the last 45 minutes, it's, I'm getting colder and colder, and it's drizzling, and it's windy. And I got off my bike at the finish line, and I sat down on the curb, and I shook uncontrollably for 30 minutes. I think if that race had been 10 miles longer, I would have been in serious uh, hypothermia at that point. So, um, blankets, and my mom and dad were there, and seaweed <laughs> and like, You know, once a mother, always a mother. I'm 54, she's like, somebody help the boy! Somebody help the boy! <laughs> my wife was like, you know, mother in law like, shut up. But anyway, um, you know, she just loves me, and I'm like, didn't die on the spot there. So, um, so anyway, that's, that's the story, um, and those are some lessons I've learned. Every race I do, I try to learn lessons. Every race I do, and even many training workouts, okay, what's my takeaway? Get at least one takeaway from every, from every race, maybe two or three takeaways. I coach some different people in triathlon, and, and after races when we debrief, I, I say, what are the three things you would do differently if you could? Because we constantly want to be learning. We, we're constant students of this sport. Uh, because one of the reasons I've gotten better and better over the years as I've gotten older. Now, imagine, I started doing triathlons in, when I was about 36 or 7. Last year, in a cycling time trial at 54, I rode my bike faster than I ever have in my life. That's what that Zone 2 cardio training can do for you. You continue to develop this, into this cardio monster. Uh, um, and it does, age doesn't really matter that much because you can go faster without your heart working harder uh, as you develop your heart more and more. So, um, so anyway, I forgot what I was saying before I went into that. But, uh, so let's do some Q&A. We've got 20 minutes. Uh, questions? Anything about <coughs> training, racing, goal setting, uh, motivation? Um, anything along those lines? Or, or anything else, too? Oh, I was just going to mention... I, she mentioned it, but I do have a book I wrote. Um, I tell a lot of race stories in here and relate them to life. So it's called See You at the Finish. This normally sells for $80, but it's 90% off today. It's 90% off, so it's only $8, and if you get to it, it's $15. So a uh, special sale just for this class. Today. So. All right, questions, comments, thoughts? So how do you know when you're in the zone two? Okay, here's the way, here's the way to do that. Can I, uh, I wonder, is there a board behind this? No, it's just right There's not, okay, that's okay. So here's how you do it. If you've got a pen, it's, uh, here's, here's, there's a lot of different ways. I like this one best. I trust this one. Uh, 180 minus your age. 180 minus your age. If you're over 50, add 5. These are beats per minute. Start at 180. Subtract your age. If you're over 50, add 5 to that number. And that's your top number in zone 2. From that number, come down about 15 beats. That's your bottom number. That is zone 2. Mm -hmm. 12 to 15. 12 to 15. So 180 minus your age. That's your top number. If you're over 50, add 5. Whatever that number is, go down about 12 to 15. That's your bottom number. That is your ideal cardio zone, too. Most of the cardio work that you do, if you stay in that zone, you will be burning the most fat and you'll be developing your heart the most. It's just the zone. I don't know why it's that way, but it's just the zone where your heart learns to become more and more efficient. So I'll be out riding with younger guys, and uh, they'll say, you know, what's your heart rate? And I'll say, I'm 128. No way, man. No, mine's 150. So my heart, I've learned to be able to go long and, and fairly fast with a low heart rate. And of course, that's huge in triathlon. You come off your bike, you start to run. You want to start running with a low heart, low heart rate as you can. So that's what I use. Doctor, if you want to read more on that, Dr. Phil Maffetone, you can Google him. Uh, Phil Maffetone. It's M-A-F-F-E-T-O-N-E, Tone. Mathetone. He, uh, he's, he developed this. He coached Mark Allen to six Hawaiian Ironman victories, so the guy knows what he's talking about. One other thing, too, the 10 points I gave are also on my blog, so if you just Google Lincoln Murdoch blog, you'll get it instead of me giving you all of them. So there's, there's stuff there. Plus, the companies that I 
try to work with, the products that I use, those are listed there as well. So if you're interested in knowing some of the stuff that I have found over 35 years of running and almost 20 years of triathlon that I feel are some of the best products to use, um, you can go to my blog from there. Yes? Like during your workouts, what, how do you monitor your heart to make sure you're in that zone too? I use a heart rate monitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can get them for, I mean, Walmart has them for 30 bucks. Or you can go way high with all the bells and whistles. Since I'm low tech, I like the lower tech version. So how's your knees holding up? <laughs> <laughs> I have knee issues and where's the best brace? <laughs> yeah. Um, knees, yeah, that's tough. Um, well, as I've gotten older, I've had to really adjust the kind of training that I do. So, for example, you might think, like, I'm putting in monster miles and I run seven days a week. <laughs> Not a chance. I swim one day, I bike the next day, and I run the next day, and then I repeat. And after two repeats, I take a day off. So some days I'll double up. Like yesterday, I would take Wednesdays off. So yesterday I swam 30 minutes in the morning, and then I rode my bike for a couple hours. Um, but I've had, to, I've had to be smarter. I've had to stretch more. I've had to do a lot more strengthening drills, resistance work, uh, to keep my muscles strong so that the, the joints and the ligaments and all that get the kind of support that they need. So... So what I do is, on my swim days, after my swim, I'll do some light upper body lifting. Okay, and I know, you can see I'm no bodybuilder. Um, but I'll just do like swim spe specific weights for my upper body. So like that would be like lat pull downs. Because you think about your swim motion, you know, it starts here. And so you've got, you've got, you've got you're pulling down this way. So I do, I do lat pull downs. I do tricep pull downs or any kind of tricep exercise, you know, leaning over with a dumbbell or sitting, you know, doing dips like that or whatever, uh, because the second half of your swim stroke is all that. It's, it's you're working your tricep. And then recovery is this, of course, and so I do a lot of upright rows. I got a, a, a elastic cable and all those things, stretch cord things. And so I'll put on a hook in my, I get a little workout room down in our basement, and I'll just do a whole bunch of those to get the, to get these babies. Um, traps, deltoids, no, deltoids. No, traps. You guys are the medical people, not me. <laughs> so, um, but and then core. On bike days, I do core. So, um, you know the old exercise ball. When I first got that thing a few years ago, I thought I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a whole bunch of these crunchers on this ball. I did like 16, and I couldn't do anymore. My stomach was burning so bad and hurting so bad. Now I'm up to like 100 with an eight-pound ball that I'm pushing with it. So you can just develop. And I'm getting old. Okay, I'm like. I'm, I'm old. I'm so old I can remember when the Dead Sea was only sick. So, <laughs> but you've got to work on strengthening more and more as you get older, okay? And then, and then on run days, after I run, I, I do lower body stuff. And so I'll, uh, you know, toe raisers. I'll do step-ups where I have a bench and one-legged repeat step-ups. You know, 25 with this leg and then 25 with this leg and then 20 and then 20 and 10 and 10. So a lot of that kind of thing, uh, lunges are just phenomenal. You've got to be careful of your knees on lunges. They bother my knees a little bit, but they are phenomenal. When I don't do those for a while and then I do them, man, the next day it feels like somebody beat my backside with a bat. It's so sore, you know, but their lunges are great. When I get injured or my knees are hurting me, uh, I don't do whatever hurts them. So I'll water run instead of regular run. I'll take an elastic band and put it around my ankle and, and put it to the, you know, anchor to the wall. And I will go through the running motion with resistance pulling back this way. I'll do this with my leg. Did you hear my knee pop? I'll do this with my leg, okay? So I'm still keeping the muscles strong. I'll lay, on the, I'll lay down with my back on the floor with a ball under my calves, and I'll do hamstring curls like that to keep my hamstrings strong. So if I'm not running because of an injury or something, I'll, do, I'll run in the water, or I'll, I'll make sure I'm continuing to do the leg exercises to keep, them, to keep the muscles strong even though I'm not running. Also, I just came on these new shoes. So here's a little commercial. If you want to write this down, look them up. Hoka, H-O-K-A, and then the word one, O-N-E, O-N-E. Hoka one one. It sounds totally bizarre. It sounds hokey, but it's not hokey, it's hoka. So hoka one onecom They are the most comfortable running shoes I have ever put on my feet in my entire life. You know, there's this whole barefoot minimalistic thing that's going on in the running world, and people are trying to get them. Just because some guy ran 100 miles and wrote a book doesn't mean that everybody can do that barefoot. Okay. Well, this is the way man was meant to run. Yes, and for thousands of years, man didn't have pavement to run on. 
That's why man could do it for all those years. Anyway, you can see I'm not a big proponent of barefoot running. But um, these shoes went the opposite direction in philosophy. They have two and a half times as much cushion as normal shoes. And when I put them on and walked in them, it was just like... It felt like I was, it felt like I was walking on a pillow. It was like, my friend, he said, try these on. He said, you won't believe me. I was like, unbelievable. So I've been running in those the last few months. I just for fun, I put on my old regular running shoes the other day. They felt like trying to run it with a brick strap to the bottom of my foot. So they're a little pricey, but if you go there, I go to the website, you can find a phone number and find out how to get them. I tell them Lincoln sent you. But, um, <laughs> they are, and I'm just saying that they are, I, I've told everybody, I said, these shoes are going to let me run for the next 30 years. I believe that, because they provide so much cushion. And I have a custom orthotic that I have made for my foot because I got a lot of issues. So the custom orthotic gives me the balance and the arch support that I need, and the shoe gives me the cushioning that's like a pillow. And so those two things together for me, I'm excited now. So, um, so anyway, yes, as we as we age, as we have issues, knees, whatever, you just have to adapt and be careful and do other things uh, until it gets better. Or I got I've had plantar fasciitis that's now turned into plantar fasciosis which means it's a chronic condition. And you all know what the word chronic means because you're in the medical world. So these shoes have helped that. I can now, it kind of hurts to walk still. Every day it hurts me to walk on it. And I've had everything short of, short of, short of surgery, two cortisone injections, the whole bit. But when I run in these shoes, it doesn't hurt. When I run, it doesn't hurt. But when I walk around, it does. That's how good these shoes are. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. So because of my schedule and I'm doing cross training, I'll do something in the morning, like this morning I'll swim and then this afternoon I'll run. Do you find that more beneficial or is it better to do back to back? No, I, I um, no. Just do it. <laughs> Whatever works for your schedule, okay. do it. If it works for you to do back to back and you want to do like a swim bike. Or more, more often people will do a bike run because it's more convenient because you pull into your garage and you have your running shoes there. But combining workouts like there, that is beneficial. That's helpful. Especially in triathlon where coming off the bike and starting to run, those of you that have done triathlon know it feels really weird because, because as you're biking along, all the muscles, all the blood is in your quads, right, and your glutes and these things. And now you're hopping off the bike and you want all the blood just to jump back your hamstrings and calves, which it takes a little time to do that. I found out in my very first triathlon that that was the case because I hopped off my bike and I took off like it was a 200 meter back on the track. <laughs> and I got 200 meters down the road and I was walking because both calves went, uh, <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow, ease into the run. I've learned. Even if it's like worlds, ease into the run. So, but if you can do both back to back, that's fine. But don't get too bent out of shape over it and don't worry about it if your schedule doesn't allow it. What about your nutrition? How did you know that you needed to take 300 calories every hour? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you said you read, read a lot. Hammernutrition.com. Okay. Hammernutrition.com. And if you order anything from them, you can get 15% off on your first order by giving them this number. Only your first order, only 15%. This isn't some pyramid scheme. <laughs> <laughs> the number is 17654. So if you order anything from Hammer, uh, 17654 will give you a 50% discount on your first order only, so make it a big one. Uh, so yeah, that's what I've learned. I've read and read, and uh, your body, you, there's no way you can replace what you're burning when you work out or in a race. And some people try to do that, and then they have all kinds of GI problems, stomach issues, they're puking, they're, or, or they're not puking because it just it's not being absorbed, and, and then you get bloated and just like... Especially in longer, you know, a, a marathon or a half Ironman or something like that, it just sits there, and then you get into real trouble. So, um, studies have shown that depending on how big you are, 200 to 300 calories an hour is about all that a person can actually replace. That's why I have my 300 calories an hour dialed in for that long bike race. And if so, here's another principle: two hours or less carb only is fine. If you're doing longer stuff, like a half marathon that's going to take you longer than two hours, or an Olympic triathlon, Olympic distance, or a half Ironman, or whatever, uh, that stuff, after two hours, you start eating protein. So a lot of different companies make sports drinks that are, some are just Gatorade, it's just carb. 
Now, I think Gatorade might have a Gatorade plus protein now. I don't know. Hammer has Heed, which is their Gatorade. And then they have Perpetuum, which is their fuel liquid. It's powder. You mix it up. But it has, it has a 4 to 1 ratio of carbs to protein. So if you're going longer than two hours, your body needs to get some protein. Otherwise, it'll start to cannibalize itself <coughs> and, uh, on, your, on your muscles. That sounds kind of gross, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. My body's eating my muscles. It's eating the protein out of them, which is not a good thing if you want to see the finish line. Any more questions?